All right, I have 1.30 on my clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to the North Central Integrated Pest Management Center's Pest and Progress webinar series. Um, our title of our talk today will be When Invasive Pests Disrupt IPM, Responding to Gall Wasp Spot Break and How High Bush Blueberries. Um, I am Lynnae Jess. I'm one of the co-directors for the North Central IPM Center. We are one of four regional IPM centers that are supported by USDA NIPA through the Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. Uh, we have a mission to coordinate IPM across the region and across the US. We started this series so that we could virtually hold required project director meetings for the Crop Protection and Pest Management Grants Program. And this is so that the PDs can, can uh, present their work. If you have questions uh, during the talk, we're gonna wait to the end to answer those, but you can type them in the Q&A or you can use the raise hand feature, which is located probably on the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Our speaker today that we'd like to welcome is Dr. Rufus Isaacs. He is a professor and extension specialist at Michigan State University located in East Lansing, Michigan. Again, you can see his title on, of his talk on the screen and his ARDP grant was titled Development and Demonstration of Short and Long-Term Strategies for Management of the Resurgent Blueberry Stem Gall Wasp. Uh, Rufus provided me with several links for like his website, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and some fact sheets, and I will be putting those in the chat throughout this talk. So without anything else, go ahead, Rufus, and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Lene. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to this group today. So as, um, as was mentioned, this is a presentation to update folks on um, progress that we've made with this grant. This started in the fall of 2018 and has wrapped up now. But I also really want to acknowledge the fact that um, this was a team effort. This was with Phil Fanning, who was a postdoc in my lab, helped me write the grant and is now at the University of Maine. Pat Edger is our horticulture professor focused on blueberry breeding and you'll see him during the presentation. Uh, I wanna acknowledge Roy Black. He's a, an economist who was part of this team and very sadly passed away during the grant. So um, I wanna dedicate this to, to Roy. And then we also, um, with this project had great collaboration from our two extension educators that focus on blueberry. It's Carlos and Mark listed here. So the context of my title for this talk is, is related to all of the international trade that's going on. There's massive amounts of movement of um, products around the world. As we've learned recently, when the Suez Canal gets blocked, we, we realize this, but it's happening all the time. And especially in the US, we're getting a lot of um, material brought in through shipping in this case, but also by air. And so there's a lot of potential for invasive pests. And a, a recent review that if you're interested, you could look at in proceedings of the National Academy of Science has put some numbers to this. And I think it's really interesting how they mapped the overall threat, invasion cost, then as a proportion of GDP, and then the invasion cost as uh, in relation to the source. And in, in many cases, the US stands out here as one of the higher uh, rated countries. And this is having impacts on our um, pests that we're trying, well, the pest complex that we're trying to manage in these crops. And we make progress in IPM programs and then we get disruption as these new insects arrive. Just for context, I did want to mention that uh, Michigan is a very diverse agriculture. I, I work in the specialty crops and we have uh, high diversity of those, our unique soils and, and landscape, and especially proximity to Lake Michigan, provides us the opportunity to grow um, a lot of blueberries, which I'll focus on today, but we also have a significant um, industry with other crops around the state. Within those crops, our, our entomologists, plant pathologists, weed scientists, all of us are focused on building IPM programs. And I like this graphic from uh, a paper that, um, that Ellsworth and Martinez Carrillo produced in 2001 in a review of the anniversary of the start of IPM. And in that special edition, they talked about all of these pieces that go together. And I'm gonna talk about each of these at some point during, maybe not every single part, but um, we'll talk about how this has been put together 
in blueberries and then how the invasive pests come in and disrupt our ability to, to um, manage and, um, and educate growers about, about these challenges. And we have to adapt. And then as I hope I'm gonna show you, we have a chance to build new programs that, that integrate solutions to those new, new challenges. So in blueberries, we have a, it's a native crop. We also have a lot of native pests that, um, including this gall wasp that I'll talk, today, talk about today, that's cranberry fruitworm, blueberry maggot. Those are all uh, native US pests. And then we've had this new arrival of spotted wing drosophila, and before that Japanese beetle, that have caused some significant disruption to our insect pest management programs. You can see part of the implications when you see pesticide use records. And this comes from the USDA NAS data sets, which are super valuable. And I hope they keep recording those, um, those data over the years. But for blueberries, it shows that we, we still are using um, some carbamates and organophosphates, the phosmet and methamyl. But since the arrival of spotted wing drosophila, we've seen a significant increase in the use of pyrethroids. Those are the green ones. And this reverses a trend that we'd seen over the previous decade where IPM implementation had reduced pesticide use both in terms of number of applications and in terms of pounds per acre. Part of that is because of invasive species. So uh, this increase is because of invasive species and, and we're, not, they're not, we're not strangers to invasive species. I think anyone that works in specialty crops has, has had the experience of trying to adapt to this. And it just keeps coming. We're, we're not yet dealing with spotted lanternfly, but that's the next one that we're expecting will eventually make it to Michigan and, and we'll have to deal with that. These uh, changes in pesticide use can have some significant impacts on insects that maybe were there in low levels, but are exacerbated when natural enemies get knocked out, such as with scale. Uh, mites are all, can also be a challenge, but we've seen as the photos on the right suggest, we've seen outbreaks of scale in recent years, unlike we'd seen previously, and that can impact the bush health and also marketability of the fruit. Right now, these are sporadic outbreaks, uh, and we hope it stays that way, but it is a warning sign that we're, we're changing the system and the insects are responding, maybe in ways that we don't want. And this is one that I'm going to focus on today. So this is a great photograph by our department chair, Bill Ravlin, of the blueberry stem gall wasp. It's a native insect and had typically been a minor issue. Every now and again, I get one or two phone calls a year from growers about this. But about eight, nine years ago, we started seeing more of it and it gradually started increasing and then it got, to, got so bad that we started this project to try and address um, some of the challenges. It's native across the Eastern uh, range of North America as this is actually from iNaturalist. If you're, if you're interested in whether your insect species is um, widely distributed, iNaturalist can be a good source for information. And people have reported it throughout the March states there. This is what it looks like on the plant. So it creates these goals and these can be both a challenge because that shoot that should have grown is now stunted. It can also be a challenge because you don't want that gall in the harvested blueberries. And so in, in hand-picked fields, you can avoid that relatively easily. In machine-picked fields, it can, be, it can be harder. Here's the life cycle. So this time of the year, these little larvae are down inside the chambers in the galls on the bushes. As it warms up in the next month or so, they're going to pupate. They'll chew their way out of this very hard gall material, fly around uh, the fields during bloom, which we'll come back to later. And you can see the little emergence holes on the galls here. And then these wasps are trying to find um, these young sensitive shoots where they lay their eggs. And you can actually just maybe see the ovipositor in injected into the um, shoot there. And they lay a row of eggs that will then trick the plant into forming the gall. They don't do this in every cultivar though. This is a really important point is that um, in susceptible cultivars, we'll see the young gall, it starts to swell after bloom and develops through the season 
spends the winter like this, and then you see the emergent soils in the spring. But there are um, resistant cultivars where even though we see a lot of um, attempts at egg laying by the adults, they do not turn into the, sw the swollen um, galls. So that's part of the strategy is in terms of the long-term part of our project has been to look at breeding. And our horticulture colleague, Dr. Pat Edger here at MSU has been trying to characterize what it is that makes some cultivars resistant and others susceptible. And he has a, um, a breeding population Oh, sorry, I'll get to that in a minute. He has a breeding population where he's trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of this. We've also gone out to multiple um, blueberry farms as part of this project and surveyed the many different cultivars that are grown in Michigan. And we can see that some are particularly susceptible up here. Unfortunately, we have had a large number of acres planted to this Jersey cultivar. Um, but then there are some that are moderately susceptible where I think I'm gonna show you later that we can manage it quite well in, the, in that setting. And then some that are completely um, resistant. And so this is Pat Edger, who I mentioned earlier, and he's been crossing different cultivars uh, and different uh, lines to understand um, how this is inherited, the susceptibility, and has found that resistance is highly heritable um, there's just a few lo loci that are controlling that, and it's, um, it's, it's stable for wasp populations that we've been sent from other parts of the country. So encouragingly, in the long run, I think breeders with their marker-assisted breeding will be able to have varieties that we know are going to be resistant to gall wasp. I want to switch to uh, another long-term part of this, which is looking at biological control. These are some photographs of the amazing diversity of insects that come out of these galls. If you hold, if you collect them in the winter when everything's dormant, and then you hold it in an environmental chamber until everything emerges after diapause, um, you get a community of insects that are part uh, inquilines, which live in that gall tissue, and some of them that may also be uh, natural enemies. And so, Blueberry stem gall wasp will come out of the galls, but also many of these other species that we assume are competing with or directly um, attacking the gall wasp. One thing we've seen when we've sampled fields that are either minimally managed where they effectively get no insecticide, they might get a little bit of mowing and the odd pruning every now and then, but no insecticide application, is that you see the gall wasp, which is blue here, is about 50% of the insects that come out. But then there's this community of four other species, four or five other species that are, that are in there. We've looked at organic fields and for organic fields that are now being treated later in the season for um, spotted wing drosophila, we completely lose this uritoma species. And that may be because even though they're using Entrust, which is organically certified, it's still toxic to those wasps. And then for the conventional farms, where we're seeing these, this increased use of pyrethroids, um, we really don't see hardly any of those natural enemies. So I think part of the story here, why this has become an issue, is that we've, we've knocked out the natural enemies when spotted wing drosophila came in. There's another aside I want to say, which is not part of my project, not part of what we've done at MSU, but there is another group working on really a whole nother direction of why gall wasp has become such a problem, which is looking at the venom that the wasp uses to um, disable the plant's defenses. And there's a really interesting preliminary set of data that I saw at the last Entomological Society of America meeting that suggests that there's, there's some differences in the venom in, in populations in the outbreak area and, and in other areas. So that's another, another part of the puzzle that another group is working on. Uh, we've compiled what we've been able to learn about mostly the biology, life cycle, and then um, some, of, some of the management into these two versions of the fact sheet. And so this is, in, they're the same except they're in English and Spanish. We tend not to put a lot of the specifics of the pesticide work into these because they get out of date very quickly when registrations change and when um, when new products come in or when old ones are 
um, phased out. So this is really, we hope, uh, useful for the long term. Um, but I'm going to switch now to talking more about the work that we have done on the insecticides, because this is part of how we're trying to solve this pest in more of the, the short term time scale. And before I get into the, the pesticide use, one thing that is something that we juggle within the blueberry pest management world is that this crop is highly dependent on pollinators. So part of this project was to think about how can we protect blueberries that are susceptible to this pest from infestation by the wasps while not having negative effects on the pollinator community? And that's a challenge because of when this insect is active. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through this. But this, this sort of theme of a new way of considering IPM, both in terms of the pest and the pollinators, is something that's developing in the, the academic world and also in the application in crops like blueberries where managed bees and wild bees are really, are really important. So this sort of sets up the context here. This is the, the period here is when the wasps are active, when the crop is in bloom is typically when those wasps are emerging from the galls and flying around. And at that time, in most large commercial blueberry farms, the growers will have contracted with a beekeeper to bring in um, hives of honeybees to pollinate the crop. And they need those bees, so they don't want to kill them. There's certainly no point spending the money on the rental fee and then negatively affecting them. So part of the juggling we've tried to do here is to find a way, maybe with applications that are done after the bloom period is finished, find a way to um, stop those goals from developing any further so that we're not making any applications during bloom. Um, but the, the, the thing is that we also have a range of insecticides to choose from. These are four that, are, that, that have context here for blueberry pest management, but Guthian was banned, um, I think nine years ago now. And so you can see that although it was a very effective on gall wasp, it also had a fairly low LD50. So it was toxic, highly toxic to bees and was not allowed to be used in bloom but also um, is no longer used for, for other reasons. We are seeing growers use Mustang Max with some effectiveness. This one is even more uh, toxic in terms of the LD50. And you can see it has a long period of hours until it loses, until its residual toxicity drops to by, by 75% down to the RT25 level. Two that I'm going to talk about here in the next phase of the presentation are vertiprin and Mavento. These are two newer insecticides that we have access to in blueberries. Um, and they provide a combination, depending on the product, of either a very short period of, of uh, toxicity to bees or very um, high LD50, which means that they're relatively safe. So you'll see both of those in the efficacy trials that we ran um, coming up. So these were done a couple of different ways. One was with a backpack sprayer, as you can see Henry all uh, geared up and ready to spray here in a, in a blueberry field. Some of them were done at our research station with a, with, a, with a tractor. And some were done, as I'll show, by growers also applying with the tractor. So we did try a couple of the more selective um, biopesticides in these trials. Didn't get um, very high levels of control, but you can see reduction in um, treatments with Bavaria. These weren't always significant, but um, there's definitely a numerical reduction in the number of goals with Bavaria, with thyme oil and garlic and other things mixed together. Um, but we're really looking for better than that in terms of the level of control um, that we're hoping to get. We've also tested a product called Cyvanto, which is from Bayer. And this one has a high LD50, so there was some potential to use it during bloom. Um, but the label has a seven day reapplication interval. And these data over here are to show that it really only lasts for three days and, and not even very good after three days. So that's been the combination of a long period of activity of wasps, the risk to bees, 
and the short residual activity means this doesn't really fit too well for this use. What we've seen some better results with is, um, oh, and I'm sorry, the letters are all kind of covering the bars there, but we've seen some better results with some um, of the newer products applied after bloom. So these were maybe two applications or one application of a combination. And that's compared to the level of control that we would have got historically with Guthion here. And so some of these are reducing both the number of goals and also especially these large goals. So that's where a lot of wasps will come out next year if they survive. We also ran a trial with systemic insecticides thinking that if we could get these neonicotinoids into the roots, they could be taken up into the plant and where the active growth of the galls is happening, we might be able to stop um, the larval development. That did not work in this trial for the products you can see tested there, but very encouragingly, we saw um, no large galls and much fewer medium galls in the spirotetramat or Mavento treatment. Even more fascinating was that when we collected those goals, brought them back to the lab and opened them up, you saw no larvae in there. And when we held those through the winter until their emergence next spring, you can see we've now got treatments like the cyclonilopril here, where we get much fewer wasps. And then the Mavento, the spirotetramat, where even though goals were formed, the larvae never survived. So really encouraging for some treatments that might work. We can put these into numbers of uh, wasps per bush, which is where you take the number of galls and you multiply by the data you get on wasps that emerge per gall. And you can see we're getting close now to some of the efficacy levels that we saw with Guthion um, a decade ago. Those are research trials with replicated plots and small areas that we treat with a backpack sprayer, but we've also, as part of this project, been able to take treatments out onto commercial farms. And so these were applied by the growers to do one or two Mavento applications in the graph on the left. And really it didn't matter that much whether we used one or two, which is encouraging that one application after bloom, once honeybees have already been removed from the field, we have the chance to um, significantly reduce this insect's abundance. We may not get to zero in one year, but I think with multiple years and we're following up some fields to follow up on this project, we, uh, we have a good chance to keep this under control, at least to the levels that don't have economic impact on the, on the growers. And then on the, on the right here, you see where this was last year, a grower applied Mavento with Lanate combined to try and get the immediate knockdown of the insect plus the long-term internal systemic effect of the Mavento. So I think we've made some progress there and we're continuing with some funding from other sources to uh, pursue this for commercial, uh, on commercial farms. So just to wrap up, I, I think this project has been super helpful for the challenge that the growers are facing with, with gall wasp as this induced pest that had been here for years and suddenly became such an issue for them. In the long term, I think the host plant resistance and the um, biological control will be important, not just for the biological control of the, of the gall wasp directly, but we're also still waiting on a petition that went into APHIS for a parasitoid wasp to control spotted winged drosophila. And if that has the intended or hoped for effect, we may also be able to reduce the insecticide applications for that invasive pest, which should have the knock-on benefit um, for this one. I think we're showing that in some insecticides can provide effective control. And importantly, I think some of those are products that can have less effect on, on bees. And I just wanna point out here in the bottom right, where we've developed with our blueberry industry, partly because of this project, a pollinator stewardship guide which allows us to have conversations uh, between extension and, and the farming community about ways that they can make their farming less, uh, less risky for the commercial beekeepers that are coming into the farms. So yes, that's helping, helping with the IPPM program development. And then lastly, I just wanted to sort of give a context of how this is affecting, this pest is affecting our blueberry industry here. Some of the most susceptible fields, the Jersey cultivar that I mentioned, they have a lot of other issues and gall wasp is one reason on top of all of those. 
that we are, we're seeing a number of those fields being removed and replanted. So there'll be new cultivars coming in and the information that we generated is helping growers make informed decisions about which ones will be um, resistant to that insect. At the same time, I think the um, information we're gathering on these newer, selective, less risky to be products is helping design some programs that will allow these moderately susceptible cultivars to be managed. Those won't need to be taken out. Those are long-term investments. Growers put a blueberry field in the ground for at least 20, maybe 30 years. And so they wanna make sure that they're investing in something that they can um, produce and not be dealing with this insect as, as part of their pest management uh, challenge. So that's my quick overview of it. I hope that was useful. I really do, again, want to thank the USDA uh, NIFA CPPM program for the support. We've been able to uh, partner with our Blueberry Commission, with our Department of Agriculture, Project Green, and some of the agrochemical companies around this issue. And I think having all of those sources of support have really, have really helped. I also wanna thank the team here at MSU that's allowed us to do this work. And since it's a pandemic, I also wanted to show a very pandemic relevant um, image um, from, one of, from one of our spray days. So thanks for your attention and maybe there's time for a question or two. Thank you. Thank you, Rufus, um, it was a great talk. So one of the questions, um, and if our attendees have any questions, please put that in the Q&A or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. But I was wondering, you were talking about um, some of these cultivars that are resistant. Are they yielding as well as the old cultivars were or, or not as much, but growers are willing to take that? Yeah, so many of the resistant cultivars are just as, they have just as much yield potential. Some of the newer genetics that have been developed by breeders, both in the land grant system and in the commercial system are much more, um, have, have much greater yield potential. And that is maybe with these fields coming out from the ones that are susceptible to gall wasp in the long run, people will see greater yields. But of course, the process of taking a field out, which takes a year and then prepping the land and then planting something new that takes a few years to become, mm -hmm. um, fruitful and, and give you a, you know, give you a marketable harvest, that, that's a challenge. Um, and it takes, uh, yeah, so it takes money and, and time to get back to full production. So I think that, that explains some of the reluctance to replant on this cultivar, but at least these new varieties have a lot of potential. All right, great. Um, another question was, how does the gall wasp rank compared to other blueberry pests that we've had either a long time ago or new ones like the spotted wing drosophila, that type of thing? So it, it's a very interesting story, I think, because it's, it's one insect on a small number of cultivars in a relatively small area of production. Um, but if you're a grower with all of the right um, combination of of settings for that to be an issue for you, it's a big deal. But I think when we look across the whole industry, um, it's it's a relatively it's relatively low on the ranking, like across the whole blueberry industry in Michigan, because there's other pests that are reliably there year after year in every field. So, yeah, I think part of the justification for this grant was that we we were seeing this outbreak and we wanted to try and develop tools to stop it because we are seeing it start to creep a little bit outside that area. Um, and there's concern about whether cultivars that might currently be seen as resistant, if the wasp changes somehow, could it unlock the um, defenses of those particular other cultivars? And then it will be more of an issue for them. So it's certainly not something that everyone is managing every year, but if you have it, it's a, it's a major challenge. Good. Um, another question was, are there other secondary pests that might become more challenging in the future? Well, if spotted lanternfly gets to Michigan, that's something we're keeping our eyes on. Um, from what I understand of it, 
for the east than us. Uh, most of its activity is, is later. And because blueberry harvest is done here usually by early September, it may not be such a concern, but that's something we're definitely uh, keeping our eyeballs on. And then I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, scale insects and some of those that might be induced by the change in the pest management program that we've had because of spotted wing drosophila. Those could become more of a concern, but I think we have some good tools for those if, if we need to control them more than we do now. Great, thank you. Um, one other question I had was, um, have beekeepers had to alter their activities because of the management for the gall wasp? Yeah, so I, I tried to emphasize that timing right at the end of bloom where um, we might have honeybees in the field or in neighboring fields. And then if you have a field that needs gall wasp control, that there's a lot of um, potential for concern there between what the grower needs and the beekeeper needs. So we've part of the plan that I mentioned right at the end there is, is to have that conversation and get the dialogue going between the grower that needs to tell their beekeeper that those colonies need to come out right when bloom finishes. And then also helping them think about the neighboring farms where there may still be, or maybe, maybe even uh, fields of their own where there's a later blooming cultivar that they have to be aware of. Um, some of the big commercial beekeepers are running thousands of hives. And so it can be hard for them to get all of those hives out as quickly as the growers might like depending on how the weather goes. So that, yeah, there's some challenges around that, but I think it all comes back to communication and what the Managed Pollinator Protection Plan here is helping to do is to foster that, that communication and make sure that people are aware of what the expectations are before, you know, before there's a late night phone call and somebody's demanding bees get removed and they can't be taken out the next day. All right, well, thank you. I don't see any further questions or hands up. So I want to again thank you, uh, Rufus, for your talk and the time that you put in for this. Um, and I want to remind everybody that our next Pest in Progress webinar will be on Wednesday, May 19th at 1.30 Eastern, 12.30 Central. And that one will be presented by Dr. Gary Weber on a push-pull strategy to manage stable flies. Um, if you want to see a list of the upcoming webinars, you can always go to our website just ncipmc.org, so for North Central IPM Center, so ncipmc.org. Um, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter, which we send out every month, a little clip about what the next speaker, who that will be and, and what their talk will be about. Again, you can go to ncipmc.org. So thank you everybody for attending. Um, if there's no additional questions, we'll let you get back to work, Rufus. And again, we really appreciate your time. Okay, thanks, Lene. Have a good day. Thank you, you too.